Hello, my name is Hugh Tonge and welcome to episode four of Conversations with Auditors, our podcast where we look at the new um, trends, opportunities and new ways of working uh, which are impacting the audit profession. And look, when we think about the audit profession, we often think about you know, reviewing historical information. But today we're going to do a bit of crystal ball gazing and look towards the future uh, and all things future of work related. And to do that, I'm joined today by my colleagues, Emma O'Driscoll, partner in our audit practice and a uh, member of our Future of Work Steerco and Susan Moyle from our people and change function who's going to hopefully bring some uh, real world uh, experience to the conversation um, look so guys thanks both for joining me today guys when I was researching this podcast and um, you know it was hard to get away from the kind of elephant in the room that is generative AI and you know how that's going to impact us in the, in the future and there's, there's a huge amount of information around you know how generative AI is going to impact jobs in the future and make jobs obsolete but I suppose the more you know shocking and surprising statistic that I came across was that um, th almost one third of people believe that generative AI has a negative impact on their work-life balance. And Susan, are you in this 31%? No, yeah, and I was really surprised because I saw that particular stat as well. Uh, you know, I've read articles lately and it says that um, generative AI is helping with work-life balance because what it's doing is allowing organizations to shape tailored uh, well-being packages for people. So mm. that stat really surprises me. Um, I know I can only talk about my job and our role um, in consulting. We deal with large data sets um, and AI is already helping us um, kind of undertake thematic analysis of those data sets, mm. um, which means less time with spreadsheets and more time in conversations with clients, which is much better for me. What about you, Emma? I agree, Susan. Yeah, AI can free up time for more valuable work. It can automate tedious tasks and give answers to common questions, suggest improvements to how we do things. And we could all use that time differently. It can also do things like helping with scheduling, helping with workload management, and all of that is undoubtedly really useful for work-life balance. However, if you think about technology, it has had a question of impact on work-life balance by really blurring boundaries. So how we manage AI will be critical. Just because I track my sleep and my Fitbit doesn't mm. necessarily mean I'm sleeping any better. So I think as we all start to use AI more, we need to be really disciplined and considered in our use of it. There's lots of benefits, loads of them, but there's also risks and challenges. And as leaders, it's really important that we're aware of the pros and the cons of using AI. Yeah, look, it's, I suppose there's, a, there's often a lot of common like misconceptions around um, what AI does, and particularly around, around generative AI. Um, I suppose, what, what are some of the key themes and trends we're seeing um, coming out in this space and what, what, might, what might we expect in the future? Um, it's interesting, actually, because our KPMG CEO Outlook report mm. um, this year showed that 73% of CEOs um, said that generative AI is the top of their investment wish list. So we know what's being talked about at the highest level, yeah. so it's going to have an impact. Um, and actually was reading something just recently about Singapore, mm -hmm. um, that the Singapore government are going to send people who are over 40 back to school um, to learn... <laughs> Um, the new technology trends due to the impact that AI is having on the future of work and the jobs out there, which is really interesting. Um, in terms of who is going to be impacted then, I suppose it might be surprising to hear that jobs that need degrees will be impacted more than those jobs where you don't need degrees. Um, so, so that's one thing uh, that we're seeing. Um, look, AI is likely to change the skills that we need in the future. It's going to impact the jobs that we need in the future. Some jobs aren't going to exist. Yeah. Um, some jobs will be created that we may not even know about at this point. Um, and I think it's a really good opportunity for organizations much more to have a skills based approach. Um, if you think what generative AI can do and looking at massive data sets and thinking about the on-demand skills that are going to be needed in the future, I think a lot of organisations are going to be enabled like never before to do these things. Um, I, th I think the key thing with all of this is that humans and the technology need to work together. Um, and, you know, people are concerned and people don't like change sometimes. Um, so it's really important that we help guide people as much as possible and strong change management. And one thing I would say, it, it's not all about AI, the future of work. Uh, there's some really interesting other trends that are happening at the moment. For example, um, organizations are likely to uh, recruit on a skills-based yeah. approach rather than going for people with degrees. 
So that's something we potentially haven't seen before. Um, also, in the past, you got a job and you got promoted and you got promoted and you moved jobs and you got promoted and then you're retired. That kind of pattern, we're likely in the future to see that not happening as much. You know, people are having breaks, sabbaticals, um, more experienced people potentially want to try an area that they don't have much experience in, which may be at a lower level. You'll maybe see people who have less experience come in at a higher level because they have a specific skill set. Mm -hmm. So I think working patterns and stuff will change as well. Yeah, and we've definitely, I think we've definitely seen that there's, you know, you see a lot of these um, kind of references that the, the one the one career per life is is gone and that is, it won't be strange now to have multiple careers in, in, in one lifetime. But so Emma, what do, what do you think about the, the whole kind of how this AI is impacting our, our, the auto profession? Yeah, well, there was a McKinsey study out recently that said one in 16 workers may need to change role by 2030. And it's all of the things that you talked about, Susan. I know some of it's AI and we talk so much about AI, but there are other trends that COVID really accelerated um, during the pandemic. Um, Firstly, and obviously, there's hybrid working and where we all work remote office and all of that. And secondly, there's a massive shift to e-commerce, the shift to online. We all do so much of our life online. Now we do our banking online. We can, go, we can effectively go to the cinema online. We do, um, we can go to the doctor online. We can go to the gym online. So all of that has had such an imp- impact on things like transport, logistics, online security. And then thirdly, there's the online um, automation, AI and digitization that has a huge impact on us as a profession, on the finance profe- profession. But I think to unpack the future of work, you have to think about how those three things work together rather than AI on its own. I think that's how you, you start to, to look into, into the, the years ahead. Maybe we just talk about AI the most because it's the hardest to understand. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And again, I, I won't dwell on it much longer, but I, if, if we look at what we're doing in KPMG when it comes to generative AI, what are the sort of I suppose, tools we're seeing that are going to be available to us, hopefully, hopefully in the near future? So we have forged alliances with Microsoft and MindBridge and others to develop innovative AI solutions to make sure that we're on the cutting edge of what's now and what's next. Our strategy is and always has been to use automa- automation and AI to um, focus on risk and to drive water quality. <clears throat> we already use Data Snipper, which is, you know, Hugh, is a really powerful mm. AI tool that automates certain order procedures. The days of ticking and bashing are, are, are slowly coming to an end. Which we're all very happy yeah. about. Um, and then MindBridge is our new tool that we'll use alongside Data Snipper. That takes an AI-enabled risk assessment approach, looking at journals and year-end transactions to make sure that we focus on the transactions and the specific things that carry the most risk. And then we'll have our own version of ChatGPT, Chat GBT, um, which is our KPMG Clara AI tool. And we'll use micro- Microsoft Copilot also. But I think also it's not just about how we'll use AI in our own business. What's important as auditors is what's happening in our clients' businesses. And from an automation perspective, what, the, what yeah. they're doing, we need to understand how clients will embed automation and AI in their own financial reporting processes. And then as auditors, we have to respond to that. So it's the tools that we have, but our response to clients' AI as well that's vital. Yeah, and that, I think that's going to be a huge challenge coming into the future about how we really integrate <laughs> our systems with our client systems. And I know that's, that's a huge, just huge projects and huge strides being made in that regard. Um, I want to just come back to one um, uh, one item that you meant before before we started going down this Gen AI um, rabbit hole, and it's around the whole hybrid model. And you know, like every week we're seeing a new headline on the front of the FT um, with you know large global organisations <clears throat> appearing to really battle back against what is this sort of hybrid working model that we've come to um we've come so familiar with over the past couple of years like are we on the way back to five days in the office there definitely has been a shift and i can feel the shift you know we work with a lot of clients and there definitely seems to be more of an office presence um which i personally think is a good thing you know that mix and given that flexibility um, I'm sure we can all remember the COVID days sitting lonesome by our laptops. It was all a bit grim. Yeah. Uh, so I definitely think that uh, having an office presence and being able to actually meet people face to face, actual humans, uh, <laughs> is a great thing. Um, I know that 64% of CEOs would prefer full time back in the office. Okay. And you can understand why in terms of innovation, collaboration, um, a lot of graduates and training and that type of thing. And it's that. Uh, informal learning, I suppose, is something that you miss um, when working from home. Um, but th- there's a lot of stats and there's a lot of articles on this particular area. Um, and I think at the moment, 50% of the workforce are office based um, and 30% want to be. Wow. And okay. I think the key thing here is 
um, another stat, and it's another 30%. Um, 30% of people don't really see the point in going to the office. It's like anything else. If you're stuck in the middle of a task, why sit for an hour and a half, potentially commuting somewhere, to sit in front of the laptop that you could maybe do at home? Um, but I think that mix is definitely important. What about you? Yeah, there's so much in it. Um, interestingly, and just anecdotally, I was with a client on Friday afternoon who said that this week they're announcing in their organisation uh, and mandating that um, employees come back to the office five days a week. And that's the first um, person or client or CFO that I've met um, since March 2020, so four years now, um, where they're mandating and rolling out five days. Wow, um, okay. So, you know, uh, just one story, but just maybe showing a direction of travel. There's no easy answer to this. Like, every year, the, the KPMG CEO survey has lots of statistics and um, loads of statistics and there's always generally one that jumps out and kind of gets to the pulse of what people are talking about and what we hear and pick up um, from our client base and in boardrooms and in, in our own organisation and I think that one that you alluded to is one of them Susan two thirds of employers want people back in the office and only one third of employees want it's a it's a big disconnect so I'll give you two views um, uh, on it and um, I guess from an employee perspective leaders need to recognize that autonomy is really important to people and having some flexibility is important in people's lives there are some structural problems at the moment in Irish society housing long yeah. commutes inadequate childcare and hybrid working does go a long way to easing some of those problems that said, on the other hand, there is just no replacement for working together. At KPMG, we're a people business and we hire almost 500 graduates a year. Wonderful, clever, bright, smart graduates, but inexperienced people. Yeah. Um, and we make a commitment to each of those graduates that we'll give them an outstanding training with excellent clients. And we take that responsibility incredibly seriously. And there is just no doubt that being in person with your team, with your clients, with your colleagues is the best way to make the most of that experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, as you said, anecdotal, anecdotally, <clears throat> we're definitely seeing the impact, especially when teams get busier. Like you can really see that the the valuable sort of learning lessons that people are getting on the job, it, it really does shine through. Um, but that being said, people do love the flexibility and, you know, uh, it is it is hard to take it away. So um, maybe, Susan, maybe looking at both home and abroad, what are the sort of flexible initiatives we're seeing coming down the track and what we might expect to see in the future? There's so many. Um, I suppose my favourite one uh, that I've come across is uh, the concept of a four-day working oh, week. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Forbes have cited this as one of the up-and-coming new exciting uh, benefits that actually works um, in terms of attracting and uh, retaining talent. Um, you know, and there's loads of other ones. You, there's well, you know, organisations who give well-being days, yeah. um, gym membership, sabbaticals, and, and lots of other things. But the four-day week is, is something that I thought was really interesting. Mm. Um, and they talk about a concept of 180, 100. Um, so okay. you get 100% of your salary for 80% of the time, but you expect 100% of the productivity or commitment. Um, so it's a it's a two way thing, very much. Um, it, it sounds like they have to. It's very much buy in from all sides or around a, a system like that. Yes, and very much a, an engagement method in order okay. to start those conversations with um, employees. Um, in Belgium, for example, they have legislated for the four day week, so they've went down the compressed route. So if you do forty hours in a week over five days, they have said that public and private sector. Um, employees can go for the 40 hours over four days. Um, but it's it's different and a lot of countries are trialing it at the moment. Um, I know in the UK they did a six month trial and 92% of the organisations who were involved in that trial have decided to continue with the four day week. Oh, wow. um, and if we think from a, an Irish perspective, there's a recruitment company Sligo based um, they have implemented the four-day working week. Um, they have had really good results, 27% increase in productivity. Uh, their wellness scores have increased by 33%. Uh, their amount of um, single-day absences have pretty much disappeared. Um, oh, okay. you know, so there is a lot out there. So Forbes and Gartner um, have said it's, it's one, of the, one of the biggies coming down the line. Emma? Well, Hugh, you won't be shocked to hear um, we, we haven't been uh, considering it at KPMG and I, I'm not aware of any clients who have been, but I have read a lot about it and mm -hmm. it, it does sound 
does sound interesting um, uh, and lots of road to run it. You know, people will, will be keeping an eye. Um, and look, you have to be open minded about these things. Like, yeah. If we've learned anything from the pandemic, it's the change comes along really quickly and unexpectedly and when we're, when we're not looking for it. The 40 hour week has been around since Henry Ford offered people five dollars to work eight hours a day in the 1920s. I know this followed suit. So you know, these these changes come along when you least expect. Um, in terms of in, m- initiatives more widely, hybrid working has brought so much flexibility and not just in that narrow sense of do I work at home or do I work in the office? But the time of day that people can go to work, the time of day that people work, the amount of travel that people do. So I wonder if the next year or two will be more about settling down those changes. I hear a lot, and then I know we talk a lot internally about the impact those changes have had on organizational culture. So mm. is are, are, will the main area of initiatives for the next year, year or two be getting hybrid work working in a way that works for employees, employers, and ultimately for culture? Yeah, because I suppose it's a real it is a challenge in professional services to implement initiatives of that nature. Um, like, you know, it, it is not straightforward for an industry like ours to bring something like that in, is it? It's not, no. And I think also with the size of organisations yeah. make, make um, initiatives like that um, more difficult as well. You know, the bigger the organisation, the, the harder it is to do. But you do always have to keep thinking about these things and looking at them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, flexibility is one thing. Um, a lot of people have seen there's a massive, uh, a massive hole in the ground at the top of Harcourt Street where our new premises is going in. Um, what can we expect to see from, from that that's really going to um, attract people to come into the office and really make the best use of their time when they are in the office? Yeah, well, you know I could go on about this all day, Hugh, so I'll just say uh, two things. Well, three things maybe if you'll, if you'll let me. Um, so firstly, togetherness. Um, for all of our Dublin-based employees to be in one building for the first time in almost 30 years, um, so long before any of us joined the, the, the organisation, uh, to have all functions, all sectors under one roof just brings massive opportunity to work together. Um, and I think that's going to be great. Then the quality of the spaces. The building has an amazing amazing space for, for training. Um, the training suite uh, is really just best in class. Um, KPMG is the best training firm in the country and we will now have a first class training suite to underpin that. Um, and I think it looks looks really good. I will have lots of spaces for teamwork, for project work, so that when people are in the office, they're together, they're collaborating, they're working together. Client collaboration suites too and innovation suites, um, similar to what we um, have at the moment in, in Platform X, but on a bigger scale and under the one roof. And the last thing um, that I'm really excited about in the building is light. Uh, there's so many studies about light that show the impact that it has on our well-being and our mental health. We don't need the studies, though. We all know that from our own lives and the yeah. stretch in the evenings and the difference it makes. And the building is full of light, absolutely flooded with it. And lots of terraces where people can have lunch or even have meetings, um, depending on the time of year. So I'm already looking forward to having a coffee up at the training floor and looking out at, at the, the views from up there. It's going to be great. Jeez, sounds Just great. need the sunshine. <laughs> yeah, sounds great. And look at, <laughs> and do anything about that. Yeah, yeah and look at Hopefully the, the grand stretch in the evening will make things uh, yeah. all the better. But um, yeah, look, when we, we, physical space and, and facilities are of huge importance. But um, what else are we seeing organisations doing, again, both home and abroad, to try and really attract and uh, retain, really, I think it's the key, the, the best talent in the market at the moment? Attracting and retaining talent is, is, the big, is the big topic, I have to say. Um, we did a global survey of employees across all sectors. Um, and it really seems that we've moved away from, I'm sure you've heard of the great resignation mm. uh, to a time of the great reconsideration, okay. we're calling it. <laughs> um, and this is where employees are really starting to think and consider about what drives them at work and what drives them at home. And I think employees now are really kind of looking for a more holistic offer from organisations at the moment. Um, so I suppose one big thing for organisations to consider is at the moment we have five generations in the workforce. Wow, okay. I hadn't thought about it like that previously. Five generations, <laughs> massive. Um, so what organisations, what some organisations are doing at the moment is taking the opportunity to review and update their employee value proposition. So right. what I mean by that is is just the, the value an employee perceives um, as getting from an organisation for providing employment. Um, and there's an awful lot involved in that employee value proposition. And with five generations in the workforce, it's going to be a challenge for organisations to think, well, how do I retain and attract those five generations? Because everybody likes different things. Um, so I know that, you know, that employee value proposition really important. Mm. Um, what can be really important 
uh, to retain people and attract people is linking what people do to a, a purpose. Yeah. Um, the values <coughs> an organisation has and the culture, I know you mentioned culture earlier, really, really important to, to attract and retain people um, in terms of their happiness at work. Development, everybody wants career paths, wants to know what the future holds for them. Um, so that's important. I know you talked about a uh, learning suite in the new KPMG office. So um, having opportunities to take advantage of that is going to be really important. Um, obviously, compensation and benefits yeah. is really important. Um, and I know we've talked about hybrid, but that flexibility, um, I think I've read a load of research at the moment to suggest that flexibility has topped salary in terms of attracting talent at okay. the moment. So, so that's a massive, massive thing for people. Um, it, it, it's just interesting. I know I mentioned happiness there. Um, but happiness and well-being is, is, is a really strong thing that's coming out at the Absolutely, moment. Yeah. Um, some research suggests that 90% of employees would make a move somewhere else if the work-life balance wasn't right. So 90%. Okay. You know, it used to be all about the money. Yeah. Uh, and the salary, but now it's very much that yeah. flexibility piece, that well-being piece, and that culture, and feeling happy. Wow, I which I think is top of our employees' value proposition. I don't, we don't have five generations, but what do you think is the overriding? Um, the five generations, Dad, yeah. minding two generations at home is tough going. So five, <laughs> five in the office is. Uh, I, I, I hadn't heard that one before. It's um, it's it, 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 You can you can see why it's so difficult mm -hmm. when when you when you put it like that. Um, the yeah, like clearly since the pandemic, people's expectations um, and people's wishes have shifted. We talk a lot more about well-being, yeah. um, uh, and people's priorities are are different. So it's really important that we're that we're alive to that. Um, and it's that that constant. Um, you know, juggle or balance between the impact on your personal well-being of of having a really flexible role and being at home more, um, and then on the organisation and culture of having people in the office and together and getting that balance right. Yeah. It's, it's... Um, and, and when I talked about having a link to a purpose, if we think of ESG at the moment, you know, yeah. that, that's not a, that's not going away no. anywhere. No. And in terms of attracting talent. Um, especially as we move into the future, um, that authentic organisational approach to really doing your best in terms of that ESG um, pace is going to be so important as well. And it's, it's funny you say that, that when you mention ESG and, and sustainability, it's, it's a skill set that's so highly sought after now in yes. the marketplace. Um, and it kind of got me thinking, you know, that's, that's one example of something that has come up at a huge um, speed and, and caught a lot of people off guard. But what are some of the other things we really need to be thinking about in terms of the skills that our people need to have into the future? Well, very much, as you said, that ESG skill set mm. is going to be extremely important. Uh, the use of technology is going to be <laughs> extremely important. And I'm not just speaking for myself there. That's a <laughs> massive need. Um, so it's thinking about what the shape of the... Um, what the shape of the workforce is going to look yeah. like in the future and then yeah. making sure you have skills to match um, what is going to be required. I think there's growing concerns um, from business leaders that they don't have the right capability in-house at the moment mm. to deliver on their future objectives. So always having that future-focused look is really important. Um, and middle managers have always been important. Yeah. They will continue to be important. Um, you know, middle managers are a really good... Uh, conjure by which you get feedback to see how our workforce is feeling about things. Mm. Um, so middle managers are going to be extremely important moving forward in terms of skills. Um, if we think about the hybrid model and equipping leaders um, with the knowledge, skills and behaviours they need in that managing a hybrid workforce is going to be extremely important. So, you know, showing trust. Yeah. It's the softer side of people management. Uh, showing empathy, um, accountability, being able to set performance metrics and doing that quite clearly mm. um, and expectation management is going to be really important moving forward um, and communication. Okay. I, for, I think from a, a 
from our perspective, um, understanding the output of technology is key, not just being able to use the technology. We're at a really exciting time um, in our auto practice where technology is changing how we all work very quickly. I mentioned earlier the sophisticated tools that we're adopting to make sense of just the explosion of data in our market and our, in our clients. But it's not just enough to be able to use them. We need to be able to interpret the output of the technology, the output of the AI, and then to use that to provide insights and, and, and findings to our clients. And then um, secondly, um, one uh, that really resonates to me and I think is really important and underrated is curiosity. I do worry that the more time we spend being task focused, you mentioned it earlier in this task focused work is a real bugbear of mine, Um, but being task focused and remote working um, means that we're not as focused on why we do things. I think being curious is fundamental to individual and organizational performance because it makes us all more adaptable, it makes us think more deeply about why we're doing something, it makes us solve problems and it goes back to enjoying what we do, it's a bit more fun and ultimately better for our well-being. Yeah, absolutely and I I want to bring it then just to bring that piece then to something we often kind of kind of hark back to and what what impact we think that is going to have and all, a lot of what we discussed today on you know people who are going to be joining the auto profession particularly new graduates coming in um, coming into us coming into other firms and and how the profession is going to shape around them in terms of the these new and emerging you know ways of working and technologies yeah so the fundamentals haven't changed. This is about training really bright young professionals to understand how business operates, to understand how business seeks out commercial opportunities, how businesses manage risk, and then accurately present those in a set of financial statements. So the, the fundamentals and the basics um, of, uh, uh, around skills and attributes are still there, but there's lots of upside in workplace changes for graduates. A bit more autonomy because of hybrid work, less, um, less grunt work, more use of technology um, to make work more interesting. I heard Jane Fraser, the CEO of Citibank, on a podcast recently, and she described AI as like an intern. So like an intern, you want AI to give you good analysis, doing research, preparing briefing notes, um, and it, behind the scenes, um, pulling lots of information together, but not necessarily making decisions. Yeah. And at KPMG, we hire and train decision makers. And we always have, and we always will. Yeah, great. Um, look, there's a, there's a huge amount of food for thought there and what we've what we've gone through but look I, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a bit nervous and apprehensive about you know what's coming down the tracks of us what's coming to the future and at the, the, the pace of change as well can often be very frightening if I was to ask you if you'd won overriding emotion when it comes to the future of work what would it be I think excitement to okay. be honest okay <laughs> um because anything that takes me less time on spreadsheets and information and more time to spend with clients and talking to people and building relationships is all good with me. So all good. Looking forward to it. Uh, energized, actually. Okay, um, okay. Really energized. I think I'd be scared if you said that I had to go back home and sit in my bedroom working for the yeah. next year. <laughs> uh, but but no, I, I during the pandemic, like, we all started to think and believe that work was something that happened on a laptop. And if you weren't task focused, you weren't really working and work was a screen. Um, I get energy, and I think most of us do, from being with people, from being with our colleagues and being with our clients. Um, so a world where AI does lots of the behind the scenes, task focused work and people in KPMG or other organizations are more empowered to focus on issues, on solving problems, on building relationships, is much more motivating for me. So energized is how I'm feeling about it. Great. Uh, look, I think we've covered a huge amount there today. So guys, thanks a million for joining me um, to discuss what is a, uh, an emerging and developing topic and one that kind of you know, moves at a, at a rate of knots. Um, and look, thanks to everyone for listening and tuning in to us today. Um, if you have any thoughts or questions on what's been discussed, you know, do feel free to reach out to your usual KPMG contact. And w- thanks again for listening.